Good morning, folks. This is uh, Richard Hall from Stonehenge Aotearoa, and this is uh, the night sky. Program's going to be a little bit difficult. This is a wind up for the year, or what I think we call wind it up, or whatever. But what we're going to be doing is looking at some of the wonderful things that are actually happening and developing here in the wire wrapper. And I've got some special guests with me at the moment. Um, now, one of them is Kay. There she is over there. Kay, give us a wave. Oh, say, say something. So. Hello. Hello, everybody. Good, <laughs> no, it's not, it's not good to see much. you, even though I can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> and and the other the other one whose person is with us is Becky. Becky Bateman. Hello. There she is there. Hello, say back. And we do have a f- additional guest. Yeah. And, uh, uh, a junior astronomer. There, there he is. <laughs> there he is, there he is. <laughs> He's hiding. He's gone all shy. And that's Hugh. Hello, Hugh. He's my mini astronomer. Wave to everybody. <laughs> Can you wave? <laughs> no, he's gone shy. He's gone shy. He'll be okay. fine. Okay. Anyway, so, you yeah, know, that's what we thought we'd talk about because um, how I actually first met Becky, for example, was on the um, Dark Sky Committee, the organisation that's um, here in the Wire Rapper to turn the, the white. First of all, it was just Martinborough, but now it's the whole... Of the, the whole world, goddamn region <laughs> yeah, into a dark sky site, which is wonderful, because I don't. Th- I think that a lot of time, I always found that people living in New Zealand don't realise the wonderful assets that we have, which is just absent from the rest of the world. But even myself, when I went along to uh, the meetings to discover that, I said eighty percent, isn't it? Of people, yeah, something shocking. Eighty percent of people in the world can't see the Milky Way, can they? It's that's right. Yeah, really quite yeah. scary. So there's all the, all these sorts of things that we we just sort of take for granted, you know. And I, I guess that all goes back to when, when I first came to New Zealand, which was many many years ago. And um, I remember I used to ha- go down to a beach, Whale Bay. It was beautiful it, you had to walk through the bush you then came down the cliff face onto the sand and there's this it was absolutely beautiful bay that was my favorite and when i went back to work the following day i said uh well i went to this place well bay and i said no i said when i got there and i said there was amazing there was nobody else there and the guy looked at me at work and said why he said did you expect somebody else to be there <laughs> But you see, I come from England, and this, mm. I used to live near London. And uh, you say, "Oh, it's a nice day. Let's go down to right to the beach." And a million other people yeah. think exactly the Absolutely. same thing. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's those sorts of things you take for granted. But going back to where we were, this beautiful night sky that we have out here, we want to turn this into a reserve to protect it. And it, it, it doesn't mean having. Not people not being able to use lights or anything mm. like that, does it, Becky? Um, no, and I think that's one of the misconceptions that I often get asked is, oh, if we're going to be reserved, does that mean we're not allowed to have any lights on outside at all? And like, no, 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 that's, that's not the point. You know, the point is that you're using light sensibly and responsibly and not just, uh, um, you know, um, yeah. overly polluting the sky. But, um, you know, people are always saying, you know, can I have my Christmas lights on? Oh, of yeah. course you can. You know, yeah. just make sure you... Yeah. You know, turn them off when you're not using them. Or it's just use it. It's really like driving down the road. Is using mm. correct lights. You don't. You don't drive towards someone with your full headlights. Well, you on. try not to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> unless you forget. <laughs> That's right. But so, it, I mean, I always, I always say to Kay, I say that uh, you know, when we're, where we are at at Stonehenge, if you a nice clear night or cloudy night, shall we say, you look out towards Masterton direction, mm. and all the clouds are illuminated. Mm. And I always have to wonder, why are we paying money to illuminate the clouds? <laughs> <laughs> and you see, the thing is, what they found in America, by putting the correct type of lighting in, so it shines downwards mm. and not upwards, they could actually cut their power bill by about 50%. It's all you know? about the money, isn't it? If you can persuade people to do it just because of money, that's, that's what you're getting. It's a good start, isn't it? That's but right. It actually saves, doesn't it? Because the light's down, there's less glare, and they actually can cut crime as well mm. yeah. because there's less places for people to hide mm. in the dark beside the glare because it's hard to see when you, they've got glare if there's a dark spot next to it you can't see but if you cut out that glare you can actually mm. see quite well mm. yeah mm. so it actually is not only saving ratepayers and you are ratepayers but it's also saving your property <laughs> 
Absolutely. And so what what we've really got here in the Royal Apple is a, a window out into the greater universe. And it's the reason that silly why I came here and probably why Becky came it is, here. Absolutely. Because the interesting thing is all three of us sit in this room used to work at Carter. <laughs> yes, anyway. it's a bit of a thing, isn't it? <laughs> no, Hugh didn't. Hugh didn't. Maybe no. maybe in the future. <laughs> maybe he will work at the observatory later on. So tell us, Becky, how did you uh, what brought you out to the Royal Apple? Um, yeah, so as you say, Rich, I used to work at uh, Space Place Cult Observatory. Um, for about eight years, I was educator and public programmer there. And then after many, many restructures and many, many changes, I was getting a bit fed up with... It, it wasn't the place that I started, you know, working at. And we'd oft often come to the Wild Upper for holidays, just hop over the hill like many other Wellingtonians. And we realised that the sky was always amazing over here. And... One day we just, uh, my husband and I just had a bit of a chat and we were like, well, I don't want to work at Carter Observatory anymore. I don't want to work at Space Place. What can we do? And he suggested actually, well, why don't we go to the World Upper and why don't you start your own business doing stargazing? I was like, well, that's a bit of a good idea. I rather like doing that. Um, and so I, I don't think he realised I was going to take him quite so seriously because about three weeks later I'd handed my notice in. We hadn't found a house. We hadn't had anywhere to live. And I was just like, right, let's just go. I had nothing, I had no equipment, nothing. But I thought, well, do you know what? I'm going to gonna go, and if I don't, I'd regret it. You know, it was one of those kind of crossroads decisions that, um, yeah, I thought this is actually a really good idea. And, um, you know, the wild app is so special. And if I don't get in there first, I would regret it that, you know, somebody else did it before me. And, um, yeah, that was three and a half years ago, uh, which is amazing. But, no, we love, we love living in the wild app, and we love being under the beautiful sky, and I love being able to just be in my house, open the back door and just see galaxies, you know, just out of my back. Mm -hmm. Just even the well, middle it, of the program. Your organisation is called Under the Stars, mm -hmm. isn't it? If mm -hmm. people want to look up. Uh, tell us about what you would do for people and what you, what, what you offer them and what you do in an evening. What do I do? So, yeah. so basically we are nomadic astronomers and nomadic stargazers. Um, so we, the, the whole point of the business, I can go to someone's house, no matter where you are in the wild upper, and show you the stars because what I wanted to t show people really was that it doesn't matter where you are in the world but you can see so much just from your back garden no matter where you are um, and that I wanted people to um, be familiar with the sky so that when they went out again like a couple of days later they knew where all the same things were because you know we pointed out like you know the moon will rise over your garage or you know Venus will be over there by that tree you know look out for it over there um, and so that was the whole kind of the the basis behind the idea really was that people didn't have to travel anywhere they could just stay at home they can enjoy the sky from their back garden they could you know have a glass of wine they didn't have to drive anywhere they didn't need to worry about toilets or mobile signal getting lost because um one of the places i did start off uh, working in was at starfield and that is an amazing site but it's just in the middle of nowhere you mm. know and people would often get lost going to it um, so what I do at someone's house is I rock up, I bring everything with me. So I bring telescopes and binoculars and star maps and blankets and torches and everything to kind of be, make it a nice, comfortable experience. And we start off by um, getting our eyes adjusted to the darkness. So we start looking at some uh, simple things to look at with your eyes, kind of, you know, um, you know, planets and the moon, that kind of thing. Uh, but also reminding people about how they use their lights sensibly so kind of showing them that if they have a red torch you know and they turn off all their house lights you're actually going to see a lot more things <laughs> than if you just keep you know your iphone on all the time but, but these are little things that like astronomers know mm. like using a red torch a little tip isn't it and yeah. it was like oh what's this well why do you have a red torch yeah. well the answer is you know what happens is that what you create within your eyes is once you some a light gets bright you begin to create these chemicals that sh cut the you particularly ultraviolet and that down right so you can still see right mm. but red light doesn't do that and of course what you want is when you're going out to the stars you want as much light to be going into your eyes as possible Absolutely. to see the faint objects and yeah. so and so that's why you're always finding your way around you use a red light right? there's um it's also physiologically linked to your brain isn't it red yes. light because like when we were living in caves i say we when we were all living in caves but when people were living in caves hundreds of people thousands of years ago <laughs> yeah. um you know you would wake up in the morning and you would go outside your cave and you'd see your bright blue sky hopefully and your brain would literally tell you wake up you know be alert because something outside that cave is going to kill you if you're not careful yeah. uh, but by the time evening came and you had you know your fires on your sunsets you know all those animals were now asleep. 
yeah. you know, so you could actually rest and relax and your brain went, ah, there's no need to be alert anymore. We can actually just kind of switch off. So that kind of red light as well is quite good because even staying outside for an hour, as you two know, even staying outside for an hour in the dark, you're going to get such a good night's sleep because your brain is just, yeah, you know, it's back in that natural circadian rhythm of, Oh, now we can go to sleep and nothing's going to kill me <laughs> when I'm asleep. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Uh, yeah, so generally uh, I go to uh, go to people's houses, bring a thing with me. We start off doing some kind of uh, um, dark adaptive um, strategies. Uh, we look at some star maps and kind of work out how to do navigating using some of the stars. And then by that time, your eyes are starting to get a bit dark and people will often go, oh, I can see another star. Oh, I can see another star. You know, and you start realising that you know, there's quite a lot of stars out there. We generally say about 3,000 on a nice, fairly clear night. And it's amazing how people kind of start going, oh, yeah, actually, I can see, you know, I can see Orion's Belt. I can see the pot. I can see, you know, those classic ones. But then, you know, you start seeing a little bit more uh, more tricky ones, like the teapot, like Sagittarius. And I'm like, oh, yeah, there it is. You know, there is the teapot, you know. Well, I think it's quite empowering also because... Mm. Um, it's really, it's really like when, I always say, it's like when you were a kid at school, you first went to school and you were presented with a map of the world and it was big and confusing and all these names and so on. But hey, after a while, your brain began to put it together mm. and it's no different with the stars. Totally. It might look totally confusing. How do you know which the name of stars? Yes. Yeah. But those patterns become very familiar yeah. to the human brain after yeah, a while and you can go out and you can pick out this star and that star and so on. But furthermore, as you begin to learn about them, everyone has got their own character, you know, mm. characteristic in different ones they're not just a point of light in mm. the sky they're more than that mm, yeah totally yeah. and just telling those stories and telling people about the stars within them you know and kind of how people have used them for years for you know navigation or to work out the seasons or you know they see that star something needs to be done you know it's something yeah. that people have been doing for thousands of years the amazing thing is they still use it with a spacecraft yes i mean when yes. they get into you know out of space they have to lock on to three objects and those are you know usually stars that we can show you mm. quite often mm. are stars that mm. we can show you yeah. that they lock on to and that's with all our technology <laughs> and everything else they're still using what their ancestors yeah. used yeah. isn't that amazing yeah. yeah don't have any trouble this with, is only with folks clouds. i should point out uh, is that the stars are actually moving mm. but what we have here is that they are so far away you know if you look at something that's a long way away on earth uh, it, standing here just thinking, it appears to be moving slow compared to a car that's close to you now it's exactly the same with the stars they're moving at great speeds around the milky way right and um but it because they're so far away it takes centuries and centuries to notice any change in the position of the stars right and indeed, the, the other problem you have is most of the bright stars that we're looking at in the night sky, they're not the common or garden average variety of star. They're often giant stars throwing out vast amounts of luminosity, but they're at great distances. And because they're at even greater distances, checking out movement becomes very small, you know. So it doesn't matter, people often get surprised. You go, for example, the Pleiades star cluster, Matariki down here, as you go around, you find that just about every culture is looking at these mm. stars, and the reason is that those particular stars rise at an important time of the year, and so they are important to people around the world. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, ha Becky, telescopes and things like that. Yes. Tell, tell us about that. Um, so I've got a couple of telescopes uh, for the business now. We've got a little mini six-inch, which looks that was my first one, but that looks so tiny now <laughs> compared to what I've got now. So I've got one ex one six-inch, and I use that to. Um, Hire out to schools, so schools can borrow that for a you know couple of weeks, um, which is quite nice. It's something that they probably will not have access to otherwise, which is quite nice. Mm. Um, I've got two eight-inch Dobsonians. I quite a, I'm a bit of a fan of a Dobsonian telescope. They're nice yeah. and easy to move around. Yeah, better tell it's people what a Dobsonian yeah. is. They won't have a clue what you're talking I about. Know. <laughs> Well, basically, it's a, it's a giant tube with a mirror at the end, isn't it? Basically, yeah. nice and simple. But it's it doesn't take long for you to work out how it, it moves works. It very moves. easily. It does, and you just basically shoot and point. Exactly, shoot and point. Exactly, yeah. that's what it is. You just look at something, and it's there. You yeah. know, you don't have to kind of worry about tripods or anything like and that. I, I'll tell you what, and you you probably back me up with this, Beggy, is that when people have never looked for a telescope before, 
peer through an astronomical telescope, particularly if they're looking at something like Saturn, they just mm. get blown mm. away because yeah. suddenly they're seeing images they would only ever see before yeah. in books, you know. Yeah. I can always tell if people are actually seeing what I'm showing them because they'll just kind of go, oh, yeah, that's nice. Like, you haven't seen that, have you? You know, it's moved <laughs> or something. And you put it on again, and they go, "Oh my god, that's amazing! Oh my god, I can see the rings! Oh my god, oh, oh my, it's like being in a book!" You're like, yeah, now, now you, I, it's you funny know. you used to say that. I used yeah. to, rem- uh, I used to d- remember that at Carter Observatory, <laughs> and I, what I learned is that because the, the big telescope there tracked you once it was on the yeah. object, you didn't have to; it, it would track it across the sky. And I knew by people's reaction whether or not they could see it. But no one, most people are not prepared to admit, oh, yeah. I can't see yeah, anything. Yeah. What am I meant to be looking at? <laughs> You're just like, yeah, you can't see it. You haven't gone, oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> oh yeah, that's nice. Thank you. I used to do that with school groups up at the big old telescope. And I'd take them up and they'd look through the eyepiece and it'd have the cap on the end. Of it. <laughs> and the, the whole dome was closed. Oh, it was so dark. <laughs> I mean, they, could, they couldn't see a thing. It was during the day, the school group. And most of them would say, you know, I can see Mars or I can see this or I can see something else. Then you get the one kid in the classroom who was really honest and said, I can't see a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so dark. <laughs> I think the other thing is that surprised me that People think you can look through clouds using a telescope. Oh, yes. yeah. yeah. And oh, they're, that's they're like, common, yeah. They're like, well, mm. how's that? I mean, if somebody could invent a telescope that could look through You clouds. do get that. When you go on the Ruth Crisp at, mm. at um, Carter Observatory, people will be dressed in their evening finery, you know. Can't you shut that, you know, gap because it's cold? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so when I go out to parties, I do kind of try and helpfully educate people how to use a telescope yeah. uh, but what i found that people do love using are binoculars you know i think yes, a lot of yeah. people don't realize how amazing especially yeah. if something Absolutely. to rest on mm, yeah, yeah you've got to kind I of really stew yourself yeah. and I, I, even, even today i, I mean i just very f- i don't think there'll be any astronomers who don't have a pair of binoculars do yeah. they yeah. because for finding you around because the thing is that the more powerful a telescope when people talk about magnification the smaller the field of view you're looking at Right. But with binoculars, you've got this lovely wide field of view and you can see things you can't see with a telescope, mm. particularly, yes. you know, big clusters and things That's like right. that. Yeah, you can that take the looks telescope looks away and then put it back, yeah. you know, uh, the binoculars away, and look at it and then put the binoculars back mm. and you can kind of recognise the same spot. Yeah. I think Matariki played is always it's much better in, in a binoculars. Than yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Because, you, yeah people don't recognise it because invariably most unless you've got a very very short focal length yeah. so we're talking technology and most oh, people don't we're talking talk. technology again yes <laughs> <laughs> but I mean yeah you can't get the whole of the cluster in the, in mm. the field of view yeah, yeah. and I, I had a pair of binoculars um, all for about five or six years before I even bought a telescope you know yeah, and same here yeah. there's so many things you can see with binoculars I mean once you, if, you got a good, if you get a good book or you know kind of something that can show you know what you're looking for and like you just tick off all those objects. It's amazing what you can actually see with binoculars. Well, how it, how it all started out with me. I mean, I've always been from a very early age interested in the sciences and astronomy and particularly prehistoric creatures. I mean, there were these f- things about dinosaurs. I was fascinated by mm. dinosaurs a long, long time ago. Do you want to know a really good fact about dinosaurs, Richard? You might not know this, but I learned this recently and I thought it was amazing. That the time difference between a stegosaurus and a T-Rex is more than a T-Rex to an iPad. Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a, oh, cool. It's, yeah. A, it's a vast period of time. It's huge, but everyone thinks, you know, yeah. stegosaurus and T-Rex was always around at the same time, but... No, they were They were nowhere near each other. No. Yeah. <laughs> and kids are getting very well educated about them. I mean, even since the time that I was teaching, where kids would say to me, Mrs. Leather, what was it like with the dinosaurs? <laughs> They are getting pretty smart these days with <laughs> the internet. <laughs> but anyway, I, I was I was always very fascinated with that and the stars and how my my uh, love of astronomy actually started. My mum used to take us to the movies, and I can remember taking us to this movie when we were little kids, you know. And you could only get into this movie if you had an adult with you, anyway. Right? And it was called Invaders from Mars, and I can remember 
being absolutely terrified <laughs> about these inv- Martians. Inv- I've, I've seen it in recent times and it's actually quite corny. But, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> but in the day, it was really, really scary. And I can remember coming back. On, we, we came back on the bus and we remember getting off the bus to walk down our road and it was a clear sky and I saw these stars. I thought, Mars must be up there somewhere. But uh, where? And that's, that's really where my interest came is all the wonderful things that have occurred on this planet evolved, including dinosaurs and everything else. Our, our world is a orbits around a star, which we call the sun, and we're in a galaxy which has got hundreds of thousands of millions of suns. And that's just our galaxy. Mm. How many other worlds are there out there? What would it be like when we discover? That's what really fascinated me and got me into astronomy. But it was much later when I um, was at work, when I first started work, like I was an apprentice of that, there was a guy working in one of the science departments, I got to know him, and he was a variable star observer. And he used to, he was a member of the Binocular Variable Star Society. So all you needed was a pair of binoculars. He said, oh, why don't you have a go at it if you've got a pair of binoculars? So he gave me some charts. He said, go out and have a look at these stars. Yeah. And, I, I, and actually, it's one of the important ones for me was actually in the Pleiades themselves. Uh, there's one of the stars there, Pleione, her name is, and the next one next to it is Atlas. Right? But sometimes Pleione is as bright as Atlas because suddenly it brightens, and she's a flare, rapidly rotating flare star. And that really got me into it. I, watching these things and realising things are changing and I learnt more and more. So, yeah. It's like Galileo, isn't it? When yeah. he looked up and he saw the moons of Jupiter kind of moving night yeah. after night. And yeah, like, hang on a minute. <laughs> What's going on up there then? You know, yeah. it just takes a little, something little, doesn't it? Just to yeah, kind of it grab is. you. Well, it's till this day, like, you just talk about Jupiter actually observing even over an evening. For mm. example, if you take Io, you can see it's moving over a little mm. period of time as it's going around, isn't it? You know, mm. yeah. Mm. So there's a universe absolutely to explore out there isn't there yeah the one thing i've noticed with people is when we get a big telescope and there there is a big one in the society's um club rooms there quite a big telescope when you point a big telescope at the moon people are really Mm. amazed that it looks like you could walk down the side of a big Mm. crater Mm. you know that that image that yeah you see suddenly realizing it's not in 2d it's in 3d and it's a world yeah. you know you can imagine yourself walking around on that i mean we all hear about moon landings but when you suddenly realize you could you could mm. actually walk across there of course you have no idea of the real size yeah. uh, when you look at it but you can see that it's a world yeah you know, in, in 3d, 3D. Yeah. yeah well they're a big a real good telescope i mean you can you can see as you know you can see cracks and crevices on the crater walls you can see the terracing on the crater walls and so on. yeah so like Kay said it's like being there they have a little mountain in, in the middle the big big mm. craters have this little yeah. mountain in the middle yeah. and it, it you learn a lot just in that one thing mm. suddenly it all that what's written down becomes real mm. yeah yeah Mm. Yeah. Well, Kay, Kay and I, we, said we all worked at Carter Observatory. and we <laughs> oh, very, I used to work at Carter Observatory. <laughs> yes, I'm not, yeah. I'm not quite sure what I'd call it. <laughs> but just there's, like, there's many people who are like, because well, I think Frank Andrews also used to work at Carter, didn't he? Oh, oh yeah. yes, yes. He yeah. was an education officer when I was an education yeah. officer. And Vicky Irons as well, was it? She yeah, was yeah. Was yeah. Yeah. Those, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we may, maybe we should make a badge. I used to work and I escaped, <laughs> or, you know, something like that. Something like that, Well, yeah. the thing was, uh, I, I mean, when, Car- when I was at Carter Observatory, it was actually a prof- professional mm. observatory, mm. right? So you had professional astronomers there were working. Yeah, they and, used to come for I, a while. Yeah. And, I, and I was put in charge of public programmes, and it's such a lovely part about it, I was, I was really given a free hand mm. to develop what I thought, because I knew what stimulated the public and making shows and so on you did the planetarium that's, shows that's how it all went until eventually yeah. one day after many many years it stopped becoming a, a professional observatory and was handed over to the wellington council mm. and then you what you had was people coming in there who didn't know a thing about astronomy trying to tell you how to run things mm. Mm. <laughs> i see you experienced the same yes. thing yes absolutely and it's like you know you can't forget so much 
misinformation and yes yeah like, yeah how, how are we meant to be educating the public if you don't actually know what <laughs> what's going on yourselves yeah that's right yeah so but anyway we we used to come out to the wire wrapper because it's an hour and a quarter's drive from wellington and then suddenly you have these pristine night mm-hmm. skies so i thought it'd be nice to get a, a piece of land out there of going by a little section and things like that and uh, oh many years ago and surely it was nice and cheap you couldn't buy a quarter acre section no. of land. The, the smallest piece of land you could buy was 20, uh, 10 hectares, 25 Crikey. acres. So in order to have a piece of land, we, we bought a little farm and, and dumped, put a little tiny cottage on there. And, uh, yeah, it was just a weekend yeah. place. But now they're out there permanently. Yeah, now, now you're a visitor destination. And then, 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 of course, eventually the Stonehenge thing came up because both Kai and I, when we was at uh, the uh, Carter Observatory, we used to run lecture courses. Now, one of them was called Legends and Mysteries of the Night Sky, and we found people were absolutely fascinated with stone circles and pyramids. Mm, well. So we always said, if we have the opportunity, let's build one. And that came up with the Royal Society, didn't it? So, Luckily, he didn't build a pyramid. And that woman over there. <laughs> no, that's why we threatened them. <laughs> <laughs> it's either a circle or a pyramid, you can decide. <laughs> no, if they, if they get too out of order, then, you know, we talk about very, building and, a pyramid. And Because we, we wanted to build a stone circle, like a stone hedge, and people thought we were building a replica of what was on Salisbury mm. Plain. But you wouldn't, because if you want it actually to work, it has to be designed for your specific spot mm. on the earth. And when people come out, they're absolutely amazed at the things our ancestors discovered mm. thousands of years ago. It is amazing. Like, they must have just spent so... I mean, it's observations, isn't it? Yeah, but their lives Noted depended this. upon yeah, it yeah, often. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is, these days, you say, who built, who designed this thing? Actually, I'm looking at her now. Wave your hand. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Kay, Kay, Kay designed the Stonehenge Artea Roa, right? We started off with the basic principle. And that was so that link between the stars and so on. So That, we have that sounds really impressive, but what really happened is everybody else ran away. <laughs> <laughs> and there was only one person left, left standing. <laughs> I'll do it then. <laughs> so I just did it. Yeah. Unfortunately, I didn't know how, you know how much was involved, but... You know, I can remember actually sitting in Carter Observatory working out ex- different plans of exactly how to build it and ringing up uh, another friend of ours who was a bit of an inventor and checking on various things. Yeah. So that's why every single pillar and every single um, heelstone is earthed <laughs> because it's all because you don't want any problem with electrolysis or mm. anything else happening. Nobody knows quite what's going to happen if you build a hinge. Mm. And it's not out of stone, so our one is particularly safe. <laughs> What's yours made out of? Um, you've got a reinforced concrete ring, okay, which is actually very deep because it was a very wet year that year, <laughs> and the papa clay kept sort of collapsing. So Katrina, my daughter, and I kept digging it out, and so when it got filled, they told me it was strong enough for a three-story building. Wow. Yeah, and so into that was set the jigs, which are um, metal brackets for holding the big, heavy um, uh, wooden frames, you know, the actual struts of it, I suppose. And there were four um, surveyors in the middle making sure that those were all lined up correctly. Yeah, and then it's on top of that you've got um, hardy backer, haven't you, and wire, and then sprayed with concrete. So it's not uh, polystyrene. No. <laughs> that was one plan. It was actually like, dearer. Was it really? Yeah, no. and less able to do it with people who didn't know what they were doing. Mm. Okay, anyway, folks, do come out and have a look uh, out there. And remember, tomorrow is the summer mm. solstice, and we've got a special program we're running out at Stonehenge on the stories of the solstice. And hopefully, if the weather improves, we'll actually get... Eight o'clock. And we've <laughs> also got Under the Stars there and... This lovely lady here, she's coming to work with us, aren't you? We're going tomorrow? To no, no, it's not oh. tomorrow. As I was a like, team. what? <laughs> <laughs> no, a team, so yeah. you, you want to come yeah. out and see the you stars? You can have a private inside. party. You can do. Yeah, anyway, we're on each I'll other's web pages. Yeah. Thank Wave. you. Wave. <laughs> <Right. laughs>